So we're we're live. Three, <laughs> three, two, one. <laughs> Welcome to WP Tonic. This week in WordPress and tech, everybody, we are live here broadcasting from all over the world. This is episode six nine five. Is that what you just told me it was? three seconds ago 695 okay thanks jonathan and uh we've got an awesome panel here today we've got two special guests which makes this an extra special episode uh why don't we go around and meet our panel for today john Locke, tell the people who you are um <clears throat> yeah i'm john Locke from lockdown seo uh providing search engine optimization for manufacturing and industrial firms Spencer Foreman. It's Spence from WP Launch 5, fresh off a 89 degree Chicago morning walk run. So uh, it's lovely here oh. today. That sounds awful. Jonathan Denwood. Oh, thanks, Stephanie. The hostess with the mostess. Uh, I'm, I'm, um, I'm the founder of WP Tonic. If you're looking to host and have a selection of plugins and help around your learning management system, we're the people to contact. Back over to you, Stephanie. Ronnie Burt is here as a special guest. Hi, I'm Ronnie. I am coming to you from home in Austin, Texas, and I lead the team at Automatic that's working on Sensei LMS. Excellent. And my good friend, Mark Westgard of hey, WS Forum, please introduce yourself to the tribe. Uh, Mark Westgard, I'm the founder of WS Form, a form plugin for WordPress. And my name is Stephanie Hudson. I'm here repping Focus WP, where we help um, agencies and freelancers to scale their business by outsourcing <coughs> to our white label teams. Um, let's dive in. Oh, before we dive into our stories, of course, we're going to hear from our major sponsors. We'll be back in just a second. And we're back. You guys check out wp-tonic.com slash recommendations and hear some of the cool offers that you can find from some of our sponsors on that page, as well as some other recommendations for some cool tools and other things. Definitely check that out. wp-tonic.com slash recommendations. It just rolls off the tongue. <clears throat> now... On to the stories. First up, we are heading over to WP Tavern, and we're going to check out this article by Sarah Gooding titled Software Freedom Conservancy Receives Court Ruling Affirming GPL as Both Copyright License and Contractual Agreement. Now, I figure we got to go to our uh, official legal representation. Spence. Can what I ring my my uh, hourly charge bell for this? D John, <laughs> sure. hit, hit the bell. Sure, send the bell to Jonathan. Ding, ding. Yeah. I'll, 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 no problem. I'll still have some Usually it's the cha-ching sound. sound. So yeah, I, you know, cha-ching, okay. <laughs> I'll do it manually, cha-ching. <laughs> you know, on past shows, I've indicated I'm a fan of um, a couple YouTubers who are really, really, you know, heavily into the right to repair stuff. And it's interesting because I also, in the past, was a big fan of Vizio TVs. They used to be sold by Costco. Now they've moved on to like Element or TCL. But the point is, you can get like a 55-inch flat panel for the cost of taking your friends out to lunch, right? The problem <laughs> is that these companies think like, well, the way we're going to sell them so cheaply is that we're never going to let anybody know what's inside. And even though basically there's just a little chip with some software in it, we're not going to let anybody upgrade and do this and that. So Lewis Rossman, this YouTuber I was referring to, and others are saying, look, we're creating huge problems in our society with this because this was an American, This it's international, but the American go to its spirit. We have John Deere tractors from 100 years ago that a guy in a barn is able to keep running. Whereas if he buys a $2 million tractor today, the thing can be basically bricked because of some software glitch. And it's just bad for everybody. Well, Vizio has a trillion TVs out there that are just bricking for something that's some guy in a shop or woman in a shop could fix for five bucks. So it's really encouraging to me. There is a carryover to what I've been yapping about this week with WordPress, but this is the way it has to be. 
we as a community, as a society, as human beings have to say, <clears throat> we can't give in inch by inch to the manufacturers and the special you know, interests saying that everything is rented to us. And when it stops working, too bad for you. Because I've ranted on other shows, I had to finally get my iPhone 8 replaced by this. And this thing costs as much as my laptop. And although I get the value out of it, I had to pay 300 a year in insurance because all the parts are serialized now. Like my guy on the corner who fixes my kid's phone for $40 can't fix this anymore. So blah, blah, blah. This is a step in the right direction. And quite honestly, in the face of a lot of other challenging Supreme Court decisions, it's nice to see that at least this field of law is going in a, a favorable direction. Uh, Mark, you got any thoughts on it? I see Mark nodding. Yeah, I, um, it's an interesting document. In, in it, it does have you know, parallels with the WordPress world, uh, with some of the stuff that's been going on recently. Um, correct me if I'm, I've spent this disappeared. I was going to ask him the question, <laughs> but um, uh, I, I, I believe that the idea was that this Visio TV had GPL software in it. Um, and <clears throat> the fact of the matter was that the SFC, the Software Freedom Conservancy, were making claims that Visio weren't making that GPL software available, um, and that's how this whole lawsuit came 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 about. So um, I agree with the ruling on this case. I mean, they absolutely should have given away this this GPL software so that um, people could fix these TVs. Um, so yeah, I, I I agree with the the ruling of it. I think if, if you've got some, if you've got a TV, this is an interesting one because in in the WordPress world, our plugins, our software that we bolt onto WordPress are freely available. You can access them. There's no way of isolating that software from the users. Um, but with a television, when you've got software in a chip within a TV, it's a lot more difficult to, to access. So in order to be able to change that and change the, the hardware and software around that TV, you've got to have access to that software and they just weren't providing it. So um, yeah, it's, in my opinion, a, a correct ruling. You guys think we're moving into like a, uh, <clears throat> like we're just in a disposable society. <laughs> like I get what you're saying about the tractors and the $2 million tractors, but when you can buy like, a 42 inch TV for like $9 and mm -hmm. then it breaks. Like this is buy a new one. This is, Henry, it's, this not Henry, it's not great. It's not great. Henry Ford did this when, when he was still alive, the original Henry Ford, he had his teams going into the junkyards to see which parts of the cars in the junkyard were still good. And that was when he originally gave mandates to stop making those parts so well. So there would be forced obsolescence. This is just a modern version of that same thing. If things last forever, then nobody buys more. They don't get parts. And, you know, there's other reasons too. The software part of it is clever as hell, but like forcing you to rent things. Like soon your Tesla might be a rental. It already kind of is for many people, you know, because yeah, they can yeah. brick the car remotely while you're on the trip. So, Ronnie, what do you think? Yeah, well, going back a little bit to the, to the WordPress side of things, something that just happened uh, like a week ago uh, with us uh, that we had a support request for um, a third party integration. And the support request was asking for full code. We had, this gets a little bit into the weeds that's over my head, but like some minified JavaScript code that shipped in that third party plugin. And this developer wanted the unminified code so that they could extend it and build off of it. Um, and, you know, it wasn't directly ours, but we, and we were able to work it out and provide that code, but it was just a reminder that like, you know, that was an unintentional, um, hiding or, or not providing and, uh, you know, something that we still need to be mindful of. I believe the WordPress plugin rules dictate that you mustn't minify your code. You can minify, but you have to provide the unminified code in a plugin in order for it to be accepted into the plugin directory. So it's interesting that they did that. Yeah, um, and this this was a like a third party paid add on, I guess. Yeah. So you know it was out of our control and it wasn't in the repo. But yeah. still, yeah, we need to follow those practices. Yeah, generally what they should do is there's a there's a constant in WordPress called script underscore debug. And if that's enabled, then you should be serving the unminified version of the plugin so that people can do debug with it. 
Um, that's the, the, the best practice um, around minified files. Do you have any thoughts on this? No, let's go on. Yeah. Okay. You're done. <laughs> Sounds like a Steph answer. All right, moving right along, we've got a LinkedIn video that um, is our next story today called Making Sense of Ethics in AI with Katrina Ingram. Um, Ronnie, do you, uh, did you get a chance to check out this video? And what are your thoughts? Yeah, I did. Um, it, was, it was nice to, I hadn't watched a video like that on LinkedIn before, so it was cool to, to see basically the nice content that they're putting there, first of all. But, uh, you know, I, I tend to be um, sometimes to a fault, like an optimistic, don't refuse to see the bad side of, of things like this. So I focused on, on the video where, where she talked about, um, you know, the potential benefits in, in AI and healthcare and in, in other realms like that, that, um, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. So I, I sometimes like jump to that as my first perspective. And then um, that's what I'll latch on to and, and only pay attention to. <laughs> I like it. John Locke, I know you got something to say about this. I didn't have a chance to watch the whole thing, but I know that there is a lot of concern with AI because it amplifies the biases that are already found. Um, for example, in um, when AI is used to produce content, for example, um, let's say about Muslim people, uh, it often will bring up references to terrorists and, and things like this because it's, it's using source material to create new content. And <clears throat> there is a potential for a lot of, of human biases to be continued on uh, in AI. So that that's a, a really big concern. Uh, it's AI is not independent thought. It's, it's basically a program which has uh, a lot of the human um, things baked into it. So it is kind of important to safeguard those things because we see a lot of um, places online that are not moderated um, and are not uh, made safe at scale uh, because those things are, are basically taken care of by AI with some human moderation. Yeah, I thought it was great, Stephanie, because, you know, I asked Morton to come on the show, but unfortunately he's travelling tomorrow internationally and he had to get ready today. But I thought mm. it was a great interview, interview. I think the main concern, Stephanie, which you can see in the Ukrainian war, you can see where this is going. You know, this is going where you're going to have semi to totally autonomous weaponry that seeks i totally semini or totally automatically to kill the enemy that you can see that with the use of drones but at the present moment they're controlled directly by human operators but in the near in you know to me those people that were, were working at boston um robotics i i, I it's their decision, but I, if I was a scientist, I wouldn't work there, personally, morally, because it's it's obvious to me where we're going, what road we're going down, and I think we're going to see this in the next five years very rapidly, that you're going to have weaponry that will make its own decision who it's going to kill, and to I feel that's morally bankrupt, and a night, a, a quasar nightmare, and we're just drifting as normally as normal down a road that's pretty ugly, Stephanie. Yeah, it's um, it's kind of like right now. It's it's so much. It's not quite infancy, but it's like toddler phase. Like when you're in a self-driving Tesla, like you still you're still babysitting. You're still making sure that everything is okay. You know, like you're still holding the steering wheel, making sure it's all good. But what happens when that reaches maturity with all of these things and 
you know, that's where the fear is. And so when you're trying to mold a moral, um, good adult, you got to start when they're kids. So are we, um, yeah, how are we handling this now? That's really such a crucial issue. Um, we have a, a great article coming up next. I'm excited to move on to the next one, but I don't want to cut anybody off. Did anybody else have any final thoughts on this um, topic of AI? We can sort of still touch on it in the next article. So that's why I think we should jump to that. Okay. Everybody's looking at me blankly. So I'm going to take that as a yes. We have a, an article on the Master WP website from a familiar face, Spencer Foreman wrote a blog post so you you get to sit back and relax you said enough here you that's, so that's what a lot of people say yeah <laughs> we're all gonna talk about we're all gonna talk about you right in front of you right now and see if we agree with you or not uh mark do you have any thoughts on spencer's article i do um assuming i've read it correctly and i've got spencer's stance uh, correct, I think I do. Uh, we were doing a bit of tweeting about this yesterday. Um, <clears throat> I, my, I'm kind of split uh, on, on. I'm kind of on the fence with the, the whole um, licensing thing around uh, WordPress. At the end of the day, I'm a WordPress developer. I need. I have to abide by the rules that WordPress put in place in terms of the licensing. Um, my plugin has to be um, open source so that other people can look at the code and manipulate the code and do whatever they want, which I love, you know. Um, <clears throat> we have a live version in the plugin directory, which people can download for free, and then we have a paid version. But basically, you're paying for support and updates. The, the core software itself is, is still open source. Um, <clears throat> I can't even sponsor a WordCamp event if my software is not open source as well. Um, WordPress stipulate that, so they're very, very strict around that. Um, the, the recent um, occurrence about around locking down software and, and not letting people use it if the license expires, um, I, I I disagree that that you know in the, in the realm of WordPress, I disagree that that's the way software should work, the way plugins should work on WordPress. I think if you purchase a plug in on WordPress, then other people should be able to use it even if the license expires. Now, in a different world, such as the Wix world and, and the Shopify world, then yeah, if you stop paying for something, that software stops working. Um, for me, commercially, that would be better uh, for me to be able to switch software off and not enable people to use it if they didn't pay for that license. But it's just morally wrong in the WordPress world. So, um, so I, I agreed with... Uh, Spencer's blog, and, and I believe that we should continue down the road of um, reinforcing that really in the WordPress world, when you pay for a license on software, you're paying for software and updates, and, and the core software should continue to work. You shouldn't just switch someone's site off. It kind of comes around this whole Tesla issue, you know, where they can switch a, switch a car off. Um, is that morally correct? Should they be able to do that once you've purchased that car? So uh, it's a difficult one. I think. A lot of people are on the fence about it. Um, I'm more of the opinion that I just want to adhere by the whole WordPress ecosystem and, and do things the right way and morally the right way. I've seen a lot of people not happy with the fact that, you know, we're starting to see these, this software get shut off. So for me, right currently, um, I, I believe that you should just be able to carry on using that software if the, if the license is, is not paid for. Um, let's see, who do I pick next? Ronnie, what do you got to say about that? I would agree with, with just about everything or everything that, that Mark just said. Um, you know, I think about the whole title of the, of the article, if I, if I'm, if I'm remembering right, if you can correct me, it's like, we're heading towards a closed, um, market. Is that right? What's the, <laughs> I don't have it right in front of me. Um, Closed source future. Closed source future. Thank you. Yeah. WordPress there we go. Hurtling toward a closed source future. Yeah. And, and um, you know, and I can appreciate there's probably some hyperbole in there, catch some attention and get some conversation going, which is, which is really, uh, you know, we all do that. And that makes a lot of sense. But I personally feel like the market's going to 
going to win this, the customers and the, you know, we're hearing already that the people aren't happy about this and that um, it'll correct there that we're, we're built with quite the opposite of closed. You know, there's a lot of plugins though that are adding in quote unquote SaaS features that maybe don't have to be SaaS features that get turned off if the license expires, things like that are in page builders um, that you can be locked in and you can't switch between. And that to me is also like a closed sort of thing. It's different than what we're talking about, but um, you know, we're all that we're bit, when we're trying to build businesses and build products, we want to keep our customers in, but we have to remember that, um, you know, data exportability and, and moving things around and is also important just as being able to access or own the code. Um, so to me, it's all related in one big conversation, which is a really important conversation just for us to keep having. Totally. Jonathan. Uh, oh, first of all, we've got a comment here from Greg Hyatt. Let me read this out for those who are just listening. He says, it's just wrong to take functionality away. A true way of turning off portents repeat. I cannot read this well today. A true way of turning off. Oh, boy. Now he just moved it right in front of What are you doing? Oh, okay. Okay. Anyway, you're turning off your customers. And then next, Greg says the problem is that the most commonly used products are the guiltiest at doing things like this. That's an interesting comment because they can get away with it, probably. Uh, Jonathan, what do you reckon? Well, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because it's multifaceted, like a lot of these problems. Mm. There, there's all angles. Um, I think they've been some fundamental problems with how pe developers, theme shops, in the WordPress ecosystem, I think profitability in some ways has declined. I think that's linked to all the changes around Gutenberg, and this is an endless subject that we've discussed over the past two years, um, and it's ongoing. I think some of the things Spencer said around full site editing is totally correct. And I totally agree with Spencer. I, th I thought I would never say uh, that. I'm sorry. Are we, good thing, Spencer, did you hear that? Did, you know, you must. You must we, we, are, we, already, we already had the pigs flying last show. Yeah, yeah, I we, know. We, they they two in a row? Orbit well, overhead. Here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for me to say that, for God's sake. But no, I totally agree with Spencer. So I think there's that aspect because I think, um, but there's also like what Ronnie said, especially with the SaaS, because I'm really interested in the SaaS WordPress model, hybrid model. And done in the right way, it's a win-win. Done in the wrong way, it clearly is problematic for the WordPress ecosystem in general and the WordPress community in general. This particular around member press, I find my feelings quite clear. I have no aminus to either um, the founder and his business partner. Um, but on the other hand, I felt it was really a bridge too far. I personally feel it's outrageous what they're attempting. Um, and I think there, there's going to be a price for both of them for engaging in this but other people like John because of the size of one of the players and his economic and political influence in WordPress um, a lot of people think that, that there's going to be no consequence for his actions I feel there I disagree with John Stephanie I think there is going to be some blow back because it's outrageous it's totally outrageous what they're attempting to do stephanie all right spence you got something to add yeah um yeah I of would, course <laughs> well we, we there was some nice feedback from the post and twitter and otherwise and uh we even heard from matt directly uh because i, I uh, mark had invited him to the comment and his comment was something to the effect of vote with your wallet. And I think that actually signs, uh, sort of sums up my view of all of this, which is I am not interested in tilting windmills or holding up banners for some, you know, rights given from above. 
I approach this as a capitalist, as a, a practical person, a pragmatist, a person who follows the tragedy of the commons as a, a, a cautionary tale, that we are in a very unique ecosystem right now that's at a fork in the road where we can really all benefit if we go one way versus the other. And it's weird, and I tried to draw this in because AI and the state of the world politics really affect my psyche too as a parent of kids and as just a human being, that we can see in a world where one side of the table has unusually strong power, rights, money, ability to take everything for themselves, it starts with small steps. And the only thing that prevents it from being like, oh, the, the, the greens have become a desert and now we got to spend another hundred years going backwards is when you recognize it before it happens, right? I'm almost channeling Morton here. And so like with AI, I'm suggesting that those of us who have been here for some time and make stuff do not have to give in to the, the outrageousness of some particular unnamed party who we all know who it is doing little baby steps towards closing it off we can say no. And for my part, I'm not doing this because I think like open source and let's all share a cup of wine. I'm doing it because I make my livelihood in WordPress and I can see that it's going to be a wasteland of two or three companies unless I and other people get together and say, hey, you know what? We can win the hearts and minds of our customers. And you know what else we can do along the way? We can solve some of those other kind of like let's collaborate on what we want to use as the tools all this full site editing versus block editor and 20 people we can fix all of that stuff because what has happened over the last couple of years in particular is a disincentivized system it used to be people would jump in and fix things but now people are disincentivized like I'm barely making a living marketing in a fishbowl full of 10,000 competitors why am I going to bother contributing my time and effort unless there's something in it for me and you know what happens in those cases? They, you know, at the political level or at the national level, the government steps in and they, for example, deunionize or they, uh, you know, uh, they demonopolize companies, right? They take the railroads from one company, they take the airlines from, and they fix it by giving it back to, let's say, pseudo private industry that is a collaboration among many people to ensure that one or two, three companies don't aggregate too much power. And so with the blessing of WordPress.org and, and Matt and the rest of the team, I feel that this is in their best interest for those of us who make stuff to kind of fix some of our own problems. Because even his own answer, in my view, is a, a way of saying without saying, vote with your wallet. He's not going to come in and do things that would interfere with his personal situation or his investor situation. He can't come in and and like tell one of these big companies, don't do that anymore. He can't. Just like the president of the United States cannot come in and just tell a private company. That. But they can use a lot of lobbying. They can use private interest groups. They can use unions. They can do lots of other pressure. And I think that that's where my personal interest lies going forward. Because I'm selfish and an entrepreneur. And I've spent 16 years here. I'm not prepared to let one or two bad actors take all of what I've built and ruin it. And along the way, if it means that other people agree with me, it's not about putting money in my pocket. It's about keeping the money for all of us and the benefit of the customers. And by the way, the last part of it is like the actual things they do wrong totally aligns with the Vizio story and with right to repair because it's unnecessary for a company to turn people off and lock them out of their data, even if it's a SaaS combination. You can have an amnesty program, right? You've been using our SaaS service. You don't want to pay anymore. You have two weeks in a fishbowl to get all of your data, and here are the tools to get it. Or if you have a subscription plugin, no, you cannot lock the person out. That's just a no. That's just clearly not what open source is. That has nothing to do with whether you run a good business or you keep customers. It's the antithesis of it. Like you do this to your customers and somebody else shines a light on you, you're going to change your practices. And so that's what I think those of us in the business should do. Shine a light on the companies that do bad and get everybody else to say, I'm on board. Where can I sign up to say my company will never do that? Yeah, what's been disappointed, disappointing, Spence, has been the total silence of some of the mm -hmm. leading people in the WordPress community. Really, they need to step up and say, no, 
this is wrong, you need to back off. They can't force anybody to do anything, but they can make it pretty hot. And But that's the problem. It, the thing that people on the front end may not appreciate, and I found this fascinating, like I say in the show, one day I was goofing around. I joined WordPress because I was in the SaaS community before Facebook of like these platforms that allowed you to put social network stuff up. I was into flying videos and other things. One day I wake up and this little hobby, 16 years later, and like I'm hanging out with all these human beings who are in charge of these multi-million dollar companies or, or venture funding and whatever. And what's fascinating, they're the same people that were just geeks hanging around the campfire fire with me. But you know what's different? They all have to protect their relationships and their internal workings and their other things. So it's no longer feasible for them to put their neck or their company on the block and point the finger at their peer when there's a financial consequence. Now, the disadvantage they have is my advantage, because quite frankly, I've always been an outspoken outlier and an agitator. And in this case, I have not the same problems as they do to point out like the emperor's new clothes story, the kid who says, wait, you're, you're, you're not wearing any clothes. And I think that's to the benefit of those who agree with the principles that got us here. And believe it or not, including some of those people you just referred to who wish they could say things, but they can't. And, and by the way, this is not ad hominem. We know who we're speaking about who runs the company. And he is one of the largest contributors to the WordPress community in general. But what is wrong is when you go too far with it. Because like if everybody was on a life raft and one person was just hoarding extra food and water at night and there was less for everybody, eventually everyone else is going to starve or you know, go, hung, uh, you know, go thirsty. And that's what's wrong here. We have a limited... Or they're going to murder that guy and take well, him out. Well, I mean, just think of it like <laughs> driving on the road. If all of a sudden you decided, Ugh, I don't have to stop at stop signs. I'm a big company. Okay, great. Until you run over a kid in the intersection or something, you know, who's following their own. So Greg says uh, in the chat on YouTube, if it's open source, then make it that. If you expect to deny usability, then start it off as a SaaS platform. And he says, I'm sure these folks know what direction they're heading in. What do you guys think about that comment? Anybody have a thought on that? John, what do you think? Do you think they know? Do you think this is all premeditated? I don't know if it's premeditated, but I think that um, there are companies with greater influence in this space that try and push the boundaries of what is accepted. I have seen a lot of companies that seem to be moving toward a SaaS product instead of a plugin uh, for the past couple of years. But as Spencer was saying, when people have their website and they see it bricked or they're denied access to um, change anything because they forgot to pay their yearly renewal or their, their card is um, expired. It just leaves overall negative perception of WordPress as a whole. Like WordPress itself is buggy and has this terrible experience. Um, but like I said, it's the companies with a lot more influence that try and push what's acceptable. Um, and yeah, and there are a lot of people who are peers that don't call out this or other, um, things that, that happen that they know about. Uh, and this is the least of the things that, that people just don't want to talk about, but um, yeah, it can affect the ecosystem as a whole. And this is one of the many factors in the seemingly uh, stagnation with the, the market share. Uh, is it a death blow for the ecosystem? No, but I, I think there can be a push to adhere to some sort of um, ethics, some codes. And Jonathan kind of did make a theme with the stories today. So uh, yeah, there should be some sort of um, guidelines that plugin plugins follow, even if they're premium plugins. They're all part of GPL. They're all part of the, the same ecosystem. And we should all have to play by the same rules.
uh, just a matter of who's in charge of making up those rules, right? Um, Spence, do you want to mention uh, or reiterate about the cooperative that you're... Yeah, so I, it, it hasn't become official, but it's likely to happen. I'm working with some of the people that have been in the higher up space and who know all the right people. And we're trying to essentially coordinate like a bridge between those that know this is powerful and good for WordPress, but can, as we've suggested, not necessarily shine the light on the bad actors. And again, this isn't intended either to punish individuals or go after particular companies. Rather, it is a way to, again, much like right to repair it, just say, Apple, we love your products, Microsoft, uh, Vizio, do the right thing. Because if you don't, the cows and sheep have ate all the grass and everybody's you know, animals are dead, like the tragedy of the common story. And in this particular case, the future of WordPress is going to come from two real avenues. Larger companies and real businesses understanding and trusting that they can be using software that won't cut them and their employees off unnecessarily or have accessibility issues, other things. And number two, the fact that we can collaborate and coordinate the efforts of all the makers so that we're no longer just feeding upon ourselves and we can start making things that go forward where right now we're in that tide pool, right? Where it's like three years into Gutenberg and FSE and who's in charge and what's going to be and da, 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 da. And this can all be fixed. Like we're really in an amazing moment in time, but because there are financial backers that will not allow certain people up top to say things to other successful companies, the rest of us need to do it. So I, I will make further announcements, but it is going to be a like sign up and there's not going to be like a big financial thing or anything else. It's going to be mostly like, yes, I would like to put my name on that declaration of independence kind of a thing. And then from there, the other stuff will follow. Thanks for taking a leadership role in these kind of things. We appreciate you. Uh, let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors again. And we're back. Don't forget at 10 a.m. Pacific, which is right after this show, you can get even more of Spencer Foreman and Jonathan Denwood on their funnelrific show that changes names every week. What's it called this week, Spence? Well, according to Jonathan, it's Sales Funnels Live. But Sales Funnels <laughs> Live. With Jonathan and Spencer. Did, did we adopt the official new name? Jonathan? Yeah, we oh. have. Okay. So, yeah. Sales Funnels Live. You can check them out live 10 a.m. Pacific on the WP Tonic YouTube channel where they do live reviews of sales funnels. If you would like your funnel to be reviewed live and in person, then uh, shoot these guys a note and submit your site. Um, all right. Back to our stories. Moving on to the great state of Texas on CNN.com. Texas has declared open season on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube with censorship law. This whole thing is, boy, it's just really something, isn't it? Okay, uh, Ronnie, what do you think? Yeehaw, I am the resident Texan, I think, on the panel. Um I do live in Austin, and we often say that it's Ooh. not exactly Texas. How's your electrical anyway. grid this morning, Ronnie? Yeah, it's <laughs> working, but I have the lights off in here for a reason. So. <laughs> um, I got to buy Rod. He's, he, he, he's sponsored by Summit, and he works for, and he and he watches this, and he's still volunteered to come on this. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, just, it's, it's a brave it takes a lot to to upset me, um, but. This particular case, like I find some things particularly interesting. It's kind of related. It's a separate case, but um, my kids and I, we like to use the filters on like Instagram or the Facebook Messenger where it like looks at your face and it'll put funny glasses or a funny hat on your head. You know, that no longer works in Texas either. Last week that was turned off here because Texas was threatening to or was causing issues with that was... Uh, violating some facial recognition thing that Facebook says is not true, but they went ahead and What about Zoom's anyway. touch up my appearance? Because we that's, need that. I think that's still working. Yeah, I think that's okay. still working. But um, okay. the meta, the meta ones from the, from the company meta, I don't know what to call them anymore. Um, 
you know, are, are not working. And so it's just kind of a snowball effect of like, what can we expect next? What, what can we do? I kind of feel that maybe one day I'll wake up and Facebook won't work in Texas. But then I think about 48 hours later, there'll be a law that says Facebook has to be <laughs> available in Texas. So who knows? Um, another thing that I don't think was in the original CNN article, but um, that was part of this decision is that email providers um, can no longer, or as part of the the law, or, or the or the, you know, I don't I don't even know what to call these things anymore. But um, the decision is that um, the like ruling, the, this, the ruling, the spam filters in email providers also are being watched and being threatened. And like you can, so from like the social media platforms perspective, the enforcement is really um, litigation, like anything else, you know, in our country. Um, but the email provider, the enforcement can be uh, a fine per message that they block um, that is found to be, um, you know, objectionable for, I mean, the, it, you can block it if you think it's, uh, you know, inappropriate content, but maybe my spam filters are no longer going to be as useful to me here in Texas pretty soon. I don't know. Um, so it's, it's a slippery slope and who knows, it's just a wild ride. I, sure I, is. I think that I'm, I'm, I'm in such two minds about these stories because it's a bit like watching, watching the trial that's going on in Virginia. I've watched a bit of it and I feel guilty of watching it because in some ways I couldn't care less. And in some ways I just feel people on the left and right are being played as dupes about, to me this is just red meat to get people on the left and the right really worked up. You know, to get them, you know, to cause, and I think there's forces in our society that just wants to get people going because they, um, they want, because they don't really want people to really talk about the fundamental, really important problems because that will affect their pocket. So they, they have people churning this stuff out. And it's just red meat for the people. I'm a socialist. I'm a Christian socialist. Uh, um, most Americans don't even know what that means. Uh, um, uh, um, I think Mark does. I, well, I come from the tradition of, of Quakerism well. and from from uh, you know British you know uh, things. Mark, uh, um, it's a very different tradition than communism. Uh, um, I, I... I, I John Locke is dying to get in yeah, here. I'm, I'm yeah. not dying to get in here, but I mean, anybody who like, follows anything that I do will know. Look, I think it's more simple than that. You, th you think it's like the, the ruling class is trying to distract like people from the important issues. I think it's a lot more straightforward than that. And all the QAnon people and all the people who are, you know, Nazi white supremacists, or the, you know, uh, people who are podcasters or, you know, the people like Rogan that want to say the N word with a hard R and think it's their, their right to, to say or whatever they want. Um, that's basically what this is. All these people are mad because Trump got deplatformed and all these uh, podcasters that, 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 you know, say all this incendiary stuff are, are getting deplatformed uh you know alex jones saying that sandy hook was a hoax and stuff like that this is what i'm talking about um and so to them it's this big culture war it's all the people who were in charge of the country like 200 years ago versus everybody else and this is them fighting back against the changes that they're seeing in the United States. And that's all this is. They just want the ability to say whatever they want because like Elon, they live to own the libs. And uh, like with Elon, like, you know, to like the thing that, that, that dropped the, in the news today, um, he wanted to get ahead of that. And, uh, you know, 
just different things. But yeah, it, that's what I see it as. It's it's part of their big culture war to uh, basically rile up their their followers, and and that's all this is. So, uh, Mark, as someone who has lived in the United States and abroad, mm. what are your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I see. In, in the states, I see that you've got, you got. There's always this big divide in this country uh, between those that want to um, defend the constitution, etc. They want the freedom of speech and everything else, and then there's the other side that want to control that, tame it, get the right information out to people. Um, I think you know, regardless of why this law was pushed into effect, I think from what I've read, it's just a, a, a huge blanket law that is is not it's pushing it too far in in the wrong direction um this this kind of um law that's going to prevent even google easing up my spam level in my in my inbox is is just you know over the top um i agree that we should encourage free speech online. Um, but I think to a degree, it's got to be controlled because, you know, I've got two children. I don't want them seeing some of this stuff online. There's, there's quite plainly some stuff out there that I don't want my children looking at. And if, if this would affect uh, my ability to control the information that they see, then I think that's wrong. I think that I should still be able to check a box and say, I don't want this type of information being presented to me or my children. Or my family. That's you know th these are what this is what we believe in. Um, this is this is what we agree with, and this is the type of content I want to see. If this law is going to prevent me from having those controls, or having even having the option of having those controls, I think it's it's wrong. I think this is to me. I mean, I'm just looking at the photograph on on the article. <laughs> it's just you know four white. Um, grown men that seem to have just pushed this law through without any regard to the implications of that. Um, it kind of reminds me of the whole cookie stuff in the EU, uh, where I think cookies were massively misunderstood. Um, and we, I think it's good that we have cookie controls on websites now, just you know, purely because of the, the tracking that they can enable. But cookies themselves aren't doing that tracking. They're, they're just a mechanism for putting information on your, on your computer so you can recall that someone's been on there. But um, here's, a, here's a tricky, here's a tricky thing. You yeah. know, I think, Mark, I think you're spot on. It's just a, it's a really tricky, it's not a zero one proposition. It's a tricky thing, free speech, because yeah. you can't, every society has got to have some rules, but, the, you know, Spencer's made it quite clear. There are strict, judicial rules around you can't i think spencer utilizes the general example you can't go into a cinema and say fire and everybody r rushes out for the nearest exit and you cause people to get injured and murder you know die it's just not allowed but on the other hand and john's got the position i feel and i'm sure he can speak for himself is that these are private um, networks, these social, and if they want to throw people off, it's their thing. But the other argument is to be an effective um, public figure. Um, if you're banned for life off Twitter or Facebook and off these, you can, you basically are disappeared. You no longer. So you've got all these separate things around tech and technology and how you make a, a balance. I only thing I suggest is that's what the judiciary is for, to make that's why they get the big bucks and the and the cozy lifestyles, because they are supposed to make those decisions to some extent, but um but the judiciary, in my opinion, in America, and it's always um it's always there. Whatever society has become very highly politicized in its own right. So you've got a real mess, really. So yeah. Let me ask a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, I, I, I think in summary, I think everybody should have a right to, to free speech. But I think 
as consumers of that information, we should have the ability to filter it and switch it off as well. So. Sure. Now, what about, what about the, like, let's not even think about what this law is, but to me, I think like there's something significant also that somebody is standing up to Facebook and big tech and all of these things, these huge monopolies, you know, it's like we, we could have, it, one day we're talking about how controlling and how much power they have and how they're a monopoly and all of these kind of things. And then the next second we're complaining because somebody's trying to shut them down, stop them from doing those things. So even if they're not doing it the way we maybe think they should be doing this, do you guys think that there's some significance to the fact that somebody stood up to them and actually won these court rulings? Any thoughts on that? No, Spence? Okay. So, this is the this is the <laughs> he's outcome. A, he's like, I, I mean, I, I, I'm I'm happy to bring up the the rear on this one. So this is the inevitable <laughs> outcome of this. Okay, when when you're a first year law student or you go through you know right, the whole process, they teach you to understand the differences first of all between legislature and the judiciary and litigation and so forth. And it's a process and it's a process that's sort of like, it's never over till it's over. What we've seen as of late is a blurring of the lines on some key things. First of all, that some of these legislatures, because they're motivated by the things John Locke was referring to, are looking for any reason under the sun to get attention to themselves because their entire focus is to stay employed and get money from, from people. That's it, companies and people. Their job is like a freelancer on WordPress to find clients to pay them to do what they do. They have become far more outlandish than ever before because in the old days, there used to be a lot of backroom negotiating and a lot of racism and other things, but it was just behind closed doors. So now it's out there for everybody to see. So people have to understand, first of all, the outrageousness of all these bills and proposals, especially in a state like Texas, who we all know doesn't have power, and the next breeze that comes along, you know, you're, you're going to be outside pedaling a bicycle to power your kid's TV, is that they can focus their energy on stuff like this, among other things. And the uh, governor... Excuse me, the kids are going to be pedaling the bicycle so Either I can way. watch TV. Okay. Yeah. So to the, to the point, the, the thing that none of these people who put this stuff out there ever have to suffer the consequences of is what happens later. But, for example, the recent trend towards saying private individuals are legally empowered to sue other private individuals and private companies is a trend that's going to end badly because they never think through, oh, it applies to me. And we've seen this already happening where in some states they've taken the right to sue privately and turned it around against the interest of these, let's just call it, Republican you know, legislators. Here in this case, what is going to happen is this law will be extended to, I can now have a new law that allows me to sue Tucker Carlson for everything he says that causes somebody harm on, uh, on you know, Fox News. Or I can sue legislature who make proposals or law. In other words, this is the kind of thing that cannot hold up from a practical standpoint, and it will only become that obvious after somebody turns the mirror around and faces it to these people. The rest of us, unfortunately, it's like Rome is burning and Nero is fiddling because we've got climate change and we've got infrastructure and we've got, you know, rights of people to be free to have medical and other, you know, all the real important stuff is getting ignored in favor of like, wh who can get the most attention? Well, that, but that's its purpose, is it, is it well, not? Be, to a certain extent, it is, because remember, it's like those movies, the sci-fi movies where all the wealthy people have those arcs in a cave that they take them to another planet when the you know, shit hits the fan. Like, I'm not saying that's here, but I am saying that there is a, a detachment between the people that have so much and so much control and everyone else. The gap between the people that are worried about their basic existence and that. I just, wanna, I just wanna give you, just before we wrap, I just wanna give you an example here. I have, surprise, surprise, some very conservative friends, all right? And I went to see one last weekend. I was, I was in Reno, and I'm doing some business, and I went round. He starts the conversation. I start getting lecturing almost as soon as I walk into the door, because he know, you know, what do you think about abortion? By the way, 
the mm. the Catholics as don't. well. Just don't. Okay, right? don't go. So I start road. getting lectured straight away, Stephanie. You know, what We're do almost you... done here. We don't right. have time to start that right. conversation. Yeah, I'm just. He yeah, has a point, Stephanie. So I start getting lectured, um, and I start getting shouted at. Basically, I get shouted at that because I don't respond to being red meated. The the individual gets more and more hot and bothered, and I'm prepared to put up with bad behaviour to a certain extent. And then I put my foot down. I said, "Look." You need to back off. I'm a friend of yours. You're shouting at me. It's your opinion. I don't believe I don't agree with the framing of this position. It's your business. It's a free country. But if you choose to keep shouting at me, we're gonna fall out and we're not gonna be friends. And he, he did calm down a bit, but I had to put my foot down. And this, but this whole business is just red meat. It's just to get people stirred up, as far as I'm concerned, Stephanie. That's its only purpose. Guys, we've got to wrap up and move on to our recommendations for the week. Thanks for all of your insightful comments on this. Um, it is a really strange issue, and there's a lot of uh, emotional elements to it. Uh, all right, moving on to the fun part of the show, my favorite part. And that is the panel recommendations. Uh, John Locke, do you have a recommendation for the tribe? Okay. Oh. Yes. My uh, recommendation uh, is a site called securityheaders.com. This is a site where you can plug in any domain and you can uh, see what uh, HTTP, P, HTTP headers are being output uh, in your site. Now, why this would be of interest to you is it could um, help you defend against possible cross-site scripting attacks. So something just to check out and to shore up. All right, that's my recommendation. Oh, cool, thanks. Uh, Mark Westgard. Yeah, um, I'm a, a big believer in accessibility, and I've been looking recently at some accessible fonts that you can use on your website, and um, found a good one from the Braille Institute. Um, it's uh, the website address is brailleinstitute.org forward slash free font. Um, so you might want to check that out. It's just uh, there are there's a lot of um, purpose built accessible fonts out there. I quite like this one, so I just thought I would share it. So that's great. Thank you. Uh, Ronnie, what do you got? Yeah, the overall recommendation, if you haven't checked it out in a while, is to look at learn.wordpress.org uh, and the team there. It's just a different way of, of contributing to WordPress as well, other than code. They're actively seeking, and this is my specific recommendation, uh, opening up a call for increasing their faculty program. And so I had a link to that. Um, they published a post a few weeks ago just looking for people to help with with content and getting people started with WordPress, but they're also increasing um, across all different levels and you know experience levels within the WordPress community and ecosystem. There, love it. Thank you, Spence. I had a client situation that they wanted to do a, a header cover video, which means you go to the top of the page. And again, I don't usually recommend anything with sliders or any slideshows anymore but a cover video is an interesting like moving billboard and it was a how test. Can you, how can you live your conscience in doing that for a client it's hard what's a cover um, video what do you mean <laughs> okay so in other words there's a new block in gutenberg new block in mm -hmm. town called the cover block <laughs> and most people just do a static image but although i wouldn't recommend slideshows some people get some attention. Like, for example, one of my clients is a camp, and it's got an intro, really exciting, well-edited video of all the kids doing stuff at camp. So when you come on, it's almost like the trailer for Top Gun. And I'm not saying people sit there and watch it because it's not like controls, but it's enough to gather enough attention. So it's a popular option that I feel complies with all the things I try to represent for sales funnels and not wasting people's time. But... It's difficult because even though I have an editing background and video and stuff, like 
a lot of people have their video editor make a video and it's 4k video and it's 38 minutes long and it's 180 gigabytes and i'm like not exactly what we're gonna <laughs> load up <on laughs> that work out <laughs> So there's a, a free tool at veed, V-E-E-D dot I-O, where you can immediately adjust that. And it's kind of like tinypng.com for, for images. And the reason it's relevant is because I ran a test. I thought I would have to use one of my custom scripts. But the actual cover blocks, depending on where you got them from, did the job of, once I put the proper size video, doing a responsive, nice job with the content. And this is the tool to compress it and I feel like it's a little bit of a, not like Adobe Flash, but it's a little bit of like, a, bring back a little bit of that motion to your client's websites without it being a drag, as long as you take a stand on the video editors and don't put in war and peace of a video at the top. So what is it called? Veed.io. It's actually an online video editing and filter platform. It's very cool for its own reason, but they have a free video compressor that you could just upload your 100 megabyte or whatever video file and shrink it down in dimensions, compress it in size, just like if you use Tiny PNG or one of those tools. That yeah, that's super cool. Really handy, thanks. And it's Jonathan. good to know that the blocks oh. actually, uh, the blocks actually did their job. Even the default cover block did the job. So when I put the file in there, and that's a surprise in a pleasant way for what we hope to achieve in WordPress. Great, Jonathan. Yeah, I've got a YouTube channel, Code Stacker. Um, I'm not active developer. I used to be, but I like to keep what the trends are and react and all that. And they've got a video, the Web Developer Roadmap for 2021. And it just, it, you just need to watch it because it really just shows how bonkers it is. It is to be a web developer in 2022 that, that you know what you're expected to know and it, it just how i own it it's just fun to watch it because you realize what a crazy bonker industry you got yourself into uh, um so there you go stephanie um i have uh my recommendation is also one for accessibility like mark uh yesterday was um, Global Accessibility Awareness Day, or GAD. Oh my God, it was G-A-A-D day. And um, someone shared this with me just yesterday when we were having a conversation about it. It's on the website 8shapes, spelled out E-I-G-H-T shapes, contrast-grid.8shapes.com. Not a catchy URL, but it. Um, we'll put it in the show notes and on the recommendations page. And it you can put in the different uh colors that you're using on your site and it will display them how other folks are going to see them what works what doesn't work etc really handy for making sure your site colors are accessible well that's it for another action-packed episode of this week in wordpress and tech thank you guys so much for being here and we will see you next week <laughs>